This is Westeros, the fictional nation that is home to a majority of the story of Game of Thrones, an ongoing book series and wildly popular TV show. I am an avid reader of both the books and was a fanatic watcher of the show. But it wasn't the incredible action sequences or high-stakes political intrigue or even Amelia Clarke that kept me interested in the story. It was how real a story that involved dragons and zombie armies was made to feel. A large part of that reality was cemented in the tangible economics of the fictional nation of Westeros. Now, for the sake of this video, we are going to try to put to the side that Westeros is very obviously Middle Ages England, and Essos, the other land featured prominently in the show, is based on Europe and Mediterranean nations around the turn of the Renaissance. This was obviously an inspiration for George R. R. Martin. But the writer has gone beyond that and interlaced curiosities from many historic economies into a world that adds a layer of complexity and realism that isn't present in typical fantasy stories of the genre. So let's explore how they work together and add to the narrative that drives Game of Thrones. Westeros is a feudal economy. What this means is that most of the citizens are relegated to work in agriculture under the governance of local lords, who fall under the governance of high lords, who fall under the governance of the crown. These citizens will work the farms in exchange for a share of the food and a promise of protection from their respective lords and their armies. Very little time is spent on what effectively adds up to a vast majority of the population of Westeros, but it shouldn't be forgotten that this is ultimately the foundation of the kingdom. Beyond this, small instances of private enterprise do exist, mainly represented in the form of brothels, smithies, and inns. This is very reminiscent of medieval England, in which the land of Westeros is loosely based. Manufacturing does not really exist, and products of Westeros are primarily limited to regionally produced, limitedly complex items that are more or less one-offs. A silly example of this is that there is no central factory specialising in making tables in Westeros. All of the individual regions and keeps likely have a carpenter who can make tables and chairs and beyond this build wooden structures and conduct repairs on their respective castles. In this example, it would be far more efficient for one region of Westeros to agree to just make wooden furniture and ship it all over the nation, taking advantage of economics of scale and agglomeration. This doesn't happen though for a few reasons. Trade and transportation in Westeros is very limited. Sure. We occasionally see merchant ships plying their trade, but we also see that getting from one side of this nation to the other side is a pretty dangerous endeavour. The other big consideration is that the nation is pretty much constantly at war in some form. There is no point letting the lords of, I don't know, the Reach set up their furniture factory if I am just going to be at war with them next year. I will be cut off from my table and chair supply, and their factory will be cut off from business because, well, suddenly half of their customers want to murder them. This is of course a very particular example of how unstable and non-advanced economies miss out on economic efficiencies that work to progress them. But it is something that is highlighted really, really well in the show. Areas of the kingdom like the North, that have a limited and sparse population and a very non-specialised workforce, are shown to have very, very basic utilitarian furniture, even in the central halls of their greatest castle, Winterfell. Conversely, areas with a larger, more concentrated population, like King's Landing, will allow for people to start specialising in more specific roles, like a dedicated furniture maker, and so the furniture shown here is far more ornate. I might literally be the only person that watches a show like Game of Thrones and contemplates how their feudal economy impacts the furniture in local markets, but it is a touch, intended or not, that contributes heavily to the believability of the narrative of this nation. While the Northerners were worrying about the impending doom of an ice zombie apocalypse, the powers that be in King's Landing were contemplating a far more terrifying reality. Debt collection. The Iron Bank is a foreign bank located in Essos, who is the financier of many of the conflicts in Westeros. The bank itself is only ever portrayed in one scene in the entire TV show, but it is referenced as one of the most influential powers in the fictional world. The Iron Bank draws many parallels with the banking houses of the Napoleonic era, this is of course a departure from the historical time period that most people associate with the story of Game of Thrones. But part of Martin's fantastic storytelling is his ability to pick and choose curiosities from throughout history and weave it into a topical fantasy story. The banking houses of the Napoleonic era, most notably the House of Rothschild, 
were instrumental in funding the war efforts of both England and France. Around this time, war had become an expensive undertaking. It had never been cheap, but the reliance of armies on new technologies like cannons and muskets made it increasingly a struggle of who could raise the most money. The banking houses were happy to accommodate, and they knew that they would hold a lot of power. Any nation or faction that tried to renege on their debt obligations, or even was so brazen as to pillage the banks, would find it incredibly hard to raise funding to go to war ever again. These banks would then just fund a more accommodating army who would set things straight and get to work repaying their loans. These banks basically introduced modern finance as it exists today, but of course, instead of financing cars and homes to mums and dads, they were financing war bonds to hostile governments. The Iron Bank and historical banks of this era had similar roles. They actually sought peace and stability, so that the kingdoms that they funded could get down to paying back their debts. So, these banks loved figures like Tywin Lannister, a powerful, stabilizing individual who even had the motto, a Lannister always pays their debts, which was like the Westerosi equivalent of a strong credit score, I guess. These banks were also happy to flip-flop on who they supported. As soon as the stability of their repayments was compromised, they were more than happy to finance a new leader who they had more faith in to repay their debts. The scene where Stannis and the Onion Knight enter the chambers of the Iron Bank is my favourite scene in the entire TV show. It is a meeting that the bank has obviously had many, many times before. It is a meeting that will determine the outcome of wars and direct the future of nations. But it ultimately amounts to a modern equivalent of someone walking into the bank branch, talking to a manager, and asking for a home loan. The underlying motivations are the same. The bank wants to weigh the risk with the likelihood that they will see a return. The silent hand of the bank has also been speculated to be a huge determinant factor in the final outcomes of the war. There is a classic adage that goes that when you owe the bank a million dollars and you can't pay it back, you have a problem. If you owe the bank a billion dollars and can't pay it back, the bank has a problem. It was noted in Season 5 that the Lannisters were deeply in debt to the Iron Bank. Many have speculated that this was a cunning play by Tywin Lannister who knew they would have to continue to support him if they ever wanted to see a return on their huge loan. When the Lannisters plundered the gold of Highgarden, Cersei potentially made a fatal mistake in doing what Lannisters do best and repaying their debts to the Iron Bank. With this, the bank no longer had to cover its financial position in the Lannisters and was free to do another cost-benefit analysis, which heavily favoured the army that had those dragons. Was this something the writers intended? I don't know, but is it something that the economic complexity of the show does allow viewers to speculate about? Yeah. I know I certainly missed the Game of Thrones bandwagon posting this video six months after a rather poorly received final season went to air, but that's okay. It's certainly something I find interesting to look at how economics can be used in the art of good storytelling. Beyond this, I hope that this is not something that comes across as looking way too far into a piece of fiction that is supposed to be more or less simply entertaining. I really like the story of Game of Thrones because it portrayed so much accuracy in all facets of the narrative. Which means it wasn't just a story for fantasy fans. It was a story for action lovers, political drama fans, and yes, of course, even huge economics nerds like myself. I mean, who watches a show filled with dragons and sword fights and naked people and thinks, hmm, yeah, that's an interesting table. I bet they didn't produce that in the most resource-efficient manner possible. But rest assured, dear viewer, when you go to rewatch seasons 1 to 5 for the sixth time, you will be one of those people too. Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed the latest video. If you did, please consider liking and subscribing. Otherwise, I will be hanging out on the Discord server for the Economics Explained channel for an hour after this video goes live to answer any questions and have a discussion about this video. Otherwise, I do my very best to reply to every comment in the comment section below. Thanks guys, bye.